If you're a hobbyist that's just getting started with building electronics or someone who has worked with electronics for many years, the ZVS driver circuit is a great project to take on. With only a handful of components that cost typically less than $10, you can build a small induction heater or a high voltage arc generator. In this video, I will walk you through how to build the driver circuit, where to source the components, and I'll do my best to set you up for success in your project. First, what is a ZVS or zero voltage switching circuit? To put it simply, a ZVS circuit achieves self-activated switching by turning on and off the two transistors at very high frequencies. This means that it controls the flow of current back and forth thousands of times per second through its output without any complicated ICs or controllers. So when we oscillate current flow in the output coil windings at these frequencies, it makes a strong electric magnetic field that saturates and collapses at the same frequencies as the current flow in the coil. If there's a ferrous object, which is an object mostly made of iron, inside of the changing magnetic field, that field will induce eddy currents into the object and it will cause it to heat up. One of my favorite things about the ZVS induction heater is that a majority of the current draw from the source won't actually happen until the workpiece is inserted into the coil. Most people watching this video are likely interested in just building one of these bad boys for funsies, so I will just try to keep it as simple as possible and just give you what you need to actually build one of these on your own. Okay, so getting into the build. When you look up a commonly used diagram for the ZVS induction heater, you'll typically find it in two configurations. One diagram will use a single inductor, and you'll notice that the work coil will be center tapped, like this heater I built here. The second diagram will use two inductors of equal value, and it won't require a center tap output coil. Like this one here that I use for my mini benchtop metal melter, and I'm going to be releasing a full video of that build coming up pretty soon. Both achieve the same function. It really just depends on what kind of design you're building and how you want the coil to be placed and how easily you want the coil to be interchangeable. For example, if I wanted to build an induction heater that could also drive a flyback transformer, I'd probably make sure it has a center tap like this one here. If I was building it specifically only for induction heating like my benchtop metal melter, then I would probably stick with the dual inductor just so it's easier to switch out the coils. Really, it's just up to whatever you're building your project for, whatever application. So let's look at the components that we need, the general specs we're going to be looking for, and then how we're going to actually put the circuit together. At the start of the control circuit power supply, we find the inductor. Inductors will be rated in Henry's, which is the unit we use to measure inductance, and it will also have an amperage rating that will be listed along with it. We have a lot of flexibility when selecting the inductor, as the specification is 47 microhenries to 200 microhenries, and honestly, I typically salvage mine from old radios or other power electronics. So prior to the inductor, the power supply also diverts down into the control circuit side of things. So the components on the control side of the circuit consist of a 470 ohm 2 watt resistor in series, a diode, and I like to use the 1N4007 diode. They're shot key fast diode and they have good insulation resistance so up to about 1000 volts. So they're pretty decent for this application. A 10 kilo ohm quarter watt pull down resistor paralleled with a 12 volt Zener diode. And finally, the MOSFET. I like to use the IRF260N MOSFET for most of these builds. So when selecting a MOSFET, you wanna make sure that the current and voltage rating is at least twice of what your expected draw to be. It is also important to provide adequate heat dissipation. You can put both on one large heat sink, but if you do, just make sure that you properly insulate the backs of the MOSFETs from contacting the heat sink, just because the back of the MOSFET actually acts as one of the terminals of the MOSFET as well. When selecting a capacitor, it's really important that you select one that is MKP or resonance rated for high frequencies. A really common capacitor to use for these kind of applications is the one you see here, which is rated for 0.3 microfarads. And this capacitor is so commonly used that even if you order one of the pre-made ZVS circuits from China, it'll come with these same capacitors on the circuit board. You can also get different MKP capacitors that are larger, can handle much more current, but I don't recommend doing this option if you're just starting out. I'd recommend sticking with the 0.3 microfarad ones just because it gives the ability to add or take away capacitors to change the frequency and the amount of current draw that your circuit will operate at. And be sure you do not use aluminum electrolytic capacitors. These will explode. Do not use these for your project. Do not use any capacitor that is not resonance MKP rated. And the last component we need to make this work is the output coil. When you wind your first work coil, I recommend doing about five or six windings close together but not touching each other. You don't want to use a wire with normal insulation on the outside because this will melt with the heat produced in the workpiece. It is a good idea to insulate the wires from each other in your work coil for an induction heater. One of the best things to use for this would be like a fiberglass tubing, which you can buy very inexpensively from the same website you buy your other components. 
Or you can do what I did for the mini induction metal melter, and that's take some plaster of Paris and sand, and you can cast your coil inside of that mixture just to help keep it insulated from the rest of the circuit. And also it will prevent shorting against your workpiece because if your workpiece contacts the coil loops, it will carry the current across it and probably blow up your MOSFETs. And fun fact, that's how I blew up my first induction heater. Okay, so now let's build the circuit. So your transistor has three pins on the bottom. The gate, the drain, and the source. The gate is gonna go to your control side circuit. The drain is gonna go over to your coil and the source is gonna go down to your ground connection. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that all your connections are rigid and you're using appropriate sized wire or copper tubing just to make sure it can handle the current. First, I prepare my mounting surface and install my heat dissipation, and then I install the MOSFETs onto the case. Then I build the control side circuit as it shows in the diagram. If you would like to, you can use a blank PCB to mount your components onto. I'm just gonna do point to point just so you can see exactly what I'm doing and how I'm connecting things together. Make sure all your components are connected in the right orientation. If something is connected backwards, your MOSFETs will likely end up exploding. Now that I have the control side circuits mounted onto the MOSFETs, I'm gonna add some suitable wires, making sure that I have a slot for a fuse just in case something shorts out so I don't start a fire or wreck my power supply. And I install my inductor as it shows in the diagram. I grab my capacitor bank that I put together for the setup and I install my work coil. As you can see, I also run the center tap from the end of the inductor through the capacitors over to where the work coil will be, as this is a single inductor circuit, so I will need to center tap the work coil. After I verify that none of the coil loops are touching each other, I can test my circuit. For this, I'm using a 20 volt drill battery. Generally, this circuit should be able to handle up to 40 volts, but I don't want to start all the way up there. You at least want to make sure it's working before you end up accidentally putting in too much power and blowing it up. If you're interested in using the CVS driver for the high voltage arc generator, what you're going to need to do is find an old tube TV, you're going to take it apart, and you're going to locate the flyback transformer. Usually it's pretty easy to find as it has the big red wire that goes to the back of the big tube, and you want to desolder this off the circuit board, and you're going to want to wrap a center tap coil around the ferrite core for the flyback transformer. About five or six turns per side should be appropriate. So you connect this the same way you would to the center tap coil on your induction heater, and once you turn it on, it will be live and active. I use a hot glue stick for an insulated handle. It works fine just for testing purposes. And you're gonna to wanna to locate the ground pin on the bottom of the flyback transformer. You can do this just by bringing the high voltage lead close to the base pins on that flyback transformer and see which pin that the arc jumps to. Once you've located the ground pin, you're just going to heat up some wire insulation, press it down onto the pin and hold it in place with some hot glue and insulating tape. And you have your other lead for your high voltage arc generator. So this runs in excess of 50,000 volts, and while it looks really cool and it's definitely fun to play with, it can be really, really dangerous if you don't know what you're doing, so I don't recommend doing it at home. The induction heater as well can be pretty dangerous to use, as it generates fairly strong electromagnetic fields that can damage electronics, and it could also interfere with certain medical devices such as pacemakers, so please use caution when using these kind of circuits. So if you are feeling confident in taking on this project and you understand all the safety precautions that you need to take to do this safely, let's go over some of the places I source my components from. Uh, you may have your own sources, you may be able to salvage them from certain electronics, but this is just where I've ordered my stuff from in the past. You can just go and Google ZVS flyback driver and you'll find all sorts of instructables and troubleshooting tips, uh, as well as a circuit diagram that you should download and take that as it's gonna have your parts list on it for everything that you need to order and go to a place like AliExpress, which is where I order a lot of my stuff from. Uh, usually I'll find a seller with good reviews and I'll load up my cart full of all the different components that they have. And usually they'll let me consolidate all the shipping into just one expense and wait a couple weeks before it arrives. This video video isn't sponsored by AliExpress. I just have really had good experiences with it in the past. And I know many people these days don't have a lot of money to spend on these kind of projects. And if you can build one of these for under $5 each, I'd say the learning experience alone is definitely worth it, as well as the cheap cost of electronics right now. Thanks for watching, guys. And be sure to keep your eye out for my next video, which is going to be me kind of showing off what I can do with my metal melter, uh, as well as I'll show you my liquid cooling setup and some of my 3D printed components that I did to make that assembly. If you like this video, please feel free to subscribe for more. And I hope you guys learned something. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to throw them in the comments. And as always, stay creative.